as a fully licensed card-carrying economic forecaster, let me begin with an old parable. On the first day, God created the sun. So, the devil immediately countered and created sunburn. God <laughs> suddenly realized she had some very serious competition. So on the second day, God created sex. In response, the devil quickly created marriage. <laughs> the devil was on a roll. Uh, on the third day, though, in search of another virtue, God thought she had finally nailed it. She created an economic forecast. <laughs> now, this was a really, really tough one for the devil. But in the end, and after an awful lot of thought, she created a second forecaster. So, in any case, <laughs> revealing my creator. Uh, since we are trying to look into the future uh, today, two basic admonitions before we start. Uh, first, I've often been accused of being much better at forecasting the past than forecasting the future. And second, I've also been accused of being the Dr. Kevorkian of the New Jersey <laughs> economy. Uh, very, very unfair, but <coughs> probably due to the simple fact that I forecast nine, fully nine of our last five recessions. So <laughs> you are <laughs> Today, I'd like to look at the long-term structural changes uh, that are reshaping New Jersey. A number of these have already been touched upon, uh, but basically the world as we once knew it is being rapidly transformed. And what's occurring are fundamental disruptions for our once seemingly immutable 20th century assumptions and protocols. So the bottom line, as has been pointed out already, the economic and demographic forces uh, that shape the past are not the forces that are shaping the future. Uh, so let me make 10 basic observations. Uh, Number one is structural demographic shifts, and this is going to be a long start, uh, and various generational definitions and boundaries do vary widely across the map, so if they don't correspond exactly to what has been presented earlier, it's not really a problem. Uh, in particular, we have four age-defined demographic long waves that are destined to transform New Jersey uh, in the 2016 to 2045 period. First is the eventual departure of the aging, suburban-centric baby boom generation, a generation that totally dominated the second half of the 20th century. These represent the values of the past. Uh, a middle aging of Gen X, or the baby bust, ascending higher into the 21st century top-line workforce, uh, young adult millennials, uh, or Gen Y, uh, redefining our basic workforce, workplace protocols, and residential markets. Uh, and Gen Z, uh, the post-millennial generation that is just now entering its post-toddler years. So let's quickly review each. First, uh, maturing 60-something baby boomers. Uh, truth in advertising. One of my favorite academic spectator sports is terrorizing baby boomers at their inexorable <laughs> aging. And I think I see more than a few maturing boomers in the audience today. Uh, but I'm going to spare you that torture. Uh, suffice it to say, this was the largest generation ever produced in U.S. history, in New Jersey history, uh, the 800-pound demographic gorilla. <coughs> And it was the driving force of suburbanization in the second half of the 20th century. By the time the 2000s unfolded, it had evolved into a maturing empty nester generation, repositioning and resizing in the housing market. Uh, 16 years later, as 2016 unfolded, the dreaded Big Bang occurred, the great calamity. Uh, the first boomers hit the big seven zero, 70 years of age. Uh, and they considered that a disaster of biblical proportions. Every seven and one half seconds, another baby boomer turns 70 in the United States. That's 11,000 per day, a pace far outstripping the casualty rate for hunting accidents and car wrecks combined. And that's going to continue until the year 2034. As a result, the generation that was once alleged to have dropped acid in order to escape reality <laughs> is now rapidly dropping antacids to cope with reality. <laughs> Suffice it to say, they are slowing down. 
trying to adapt to cutting edge technologies, <laughs> facing retirement, and actually retiring. Uh, but they are not going to go away quietly. Uh, there's still going to be a market force for some time to come. In fact, old hippie baby boomers never die. They just fade away in tie-dye colors. Uh, and fade away, they will. Uh, the baby boom was the classic pig in the demographic python. Uh, but over the next three decades, they're going to be exiting the rear end of the python. Uh, 2045, uh, they will be the ancients. Uh, the survivors will be between 81 and 99 years of age. Uh, and they will long have since vanished uh, as an economic force. Uh, but more immediately, the current aging of the baby boom out of the workforce represents the greatest uh, brain drain in the nation's history. And so a key task today is how to uh, capture and retain retiring baby boom knowledge, uh, and that's going to be a critical uh, issue for all organizations over the coming decade. Now, as an aside, uh, a leading edge maturing baby boomer came to me earlier this morning and expressed deep concern about getting older. I won't tell you his name, but his initials are Michael Kerwin. <laughs> <laughs> boomer. Ahead of you lies romance, adventure, excitement, mystery, and a lot of other great reading. <laughs> the second long wave is Gen X, uh, the baby bust cohort. Uh, so move over, boomers. 2016 is the beginning of a new era. The first Gen Xers turned 51 this year. Uh, as was noted before, Gen X is that undersized population cohort produced uh, during the low birth era from 1965 through 1979. Uh, this is America's neglected middle child. It's sandwiched between the two noisy behemoths, uh, the huge baby boom and millennial generations. Uh, now in mid-career, uh, Gen Xers are 37 to 51 years of age. They're furiously engaged in raising families. Uh, they are moving into the top line workforce and are poised to assume the economic leadership ranks left open by exiting boomers. Uh, succession planning in both the private and public sectors is an increasing concern. Uh, and over the next several decades, they will fill the leadership ranks and will increasingly dominate the C-suite before exiting from it. Uh, and they too will become empty nesters after they complete the family raising stage of their life cycle. But by 2045, it will be Gen X's turn uh, to join the ancients. Uh, they, will be they will be between 66 and 80 years old, uh, their economic relevance considerably diminished. Uh, the third long wave is Gen Y or Millennials. Now, I know you're all probably suffering from millennial fatigue, uh, but bear with me. Uh, one definition, uh, they were born between 1980 and 2000, uh, and they are generally defined as being the first generation cohort raised in the digital age. Uh, 2016, uh, they're 16 to 36 years of age. They've just supplanted the baby boom as the largest sector of the workforce. They are obviously a tech-savvy generation, a rental housing generation, wanting 24-7 LWP environments, live-work-play environments. Uh, transit and walkability are par par paramount. Uh, so compared to their suburban-centric baby boom parents, they are today mostly an urban-centric generation, a completely different value system. Uh, while their parents couldn't wait to get out of Brooklyn, millennials can't wait to get into Brooklyn. Uh, their predominant spatial movement to date could be simply described as sprawl withdrawal, uh, exit the outer suburbs. The current economic expansion in the United States is now in its 88th month, 88th month. We are now in the fourth longest economic expansion in history. Uh, <clears throat> but many millennials still face difficulties in the housing market. And what they can afford is illustrated on the far right side of the slide. As a result, a record number of adult children currently are still living with their parents. 
Now, nationally, 34 percent of 18 to 34-year-olds are still stuck in the parental hearth. That's a record high percentage. New Jersey has the dubious distinction of ranking number one of all the states. 47% uh, <coughs> of young adults live here with their parents. Hunterdon, at the bottom of the slide, ranks number one among New Jersey's 21 counties, 61%. Uh, now, we're not, if, proud of it, we're not proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if we extrapolate this trend, Hunterdon and its two neighboring counties, Warren and Hunterdon, will have just two types of adults in the future, the not yet wed and the nearly dead. <laughs> not yet wed and nearly dead. I consider myself on the right side of that, the nearly dead cohort. Uh, so I guess you can say I'm getting on in years. I now stand as living proof that you are only young once, but you can be immature forever. <laughs> but the era of millennials in the family raising stage of the household life cycle is now commencing in full force. And that's going to prevail for the foreseeable future. So their current shelter choices and locational preferences have already been restructuring uh, the region. Uh, will their preferences change as they move into the family raising stage of the life cycle? And that's a key question that remains to be answered. Uh, by 2045, they will be between 45 and 65 years of age uh, and will totally command the economy and many of its public and private institutions. So basically, millennials will rule. Uh, while they may not engender your full confidence today, uh, I fully expect them to more than rise to the occasion. Let's hope. Fourth long wave is Generation Z. So if you're tired of bashing millennials, uh, you'll have a new generation to complain about, Gen Z. Uh, currently, there's little demographic consensus on when this population cohort uh, precisely starts and ends. Let's just say it's the post-millennial generation uh, born post-2000 and is generally the product of Gen X reproducing itself. Uh, unlike the baby boom categorization, which is the upper left in the slide, and unlike the Gen X categorization, the upper right in the slide, and unlike Gen Y millennials, the bottom of the slide, we have yet to f fully distill Gen Z's generational essence if there is such a thing as a singular generational <coughs> essence. Uh, but what is apparent is that while Gen Y millennials comprise the first generation raised in the digital age, Gen Z is the first generation raised in the mobile era of smartphones and social media. Uh, they have grown up with access and connectivity to everything, everywhere. Uh, there is much analysis so far by marketers on how Gen Z differs from Gen Y millennials, but I think it's really too soon to speculate on their workforce impact, workplace impact, shelter impact, transportation impact, but impact it, it eventually will in large fashion. So over the 20 to 40, 2020 to 2045 period, Gen Z will sec sequentially dominate the entry-level workforce and then the middle-level workforce dominate the entry-level housing market and enter the family-raising stage of the life cycle. Uh, bottom line, fundamental paradigm shift. So the demographics of the first half of the 21st century are and will continue to be dramatically different from the demographics that prevailed in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, which leads to observation two, the attenuation of the great era of automobile-driven suburbanization. You know, as we all know, the second half of the 20th century was defined by relentless suburbanization, uh, expansion, moving ever, ever outward from the historic core of the region. Now, one way to show the power and scale of that past dynamic is a comparison of the job growth in New Jersey versus that of New York City. While we all know that this is happening, the shifting metrics are still startling. Ancient history. Uh, this slide compares the employment levels of New York and New Jersey uh, in 1950 and then in 2004. Uh, 
1950, the top half of the slide, New Jersey's economy as benchmarked by total employment was less than half, just 48 percent the size uh, of New York <coughs> City's. New Jersey had 1.7 million jobs, uh, New York City 3.5 million. Uh, by 2004, the bottom half of the slide, New Jersey's employment level was 13 percent greater. New Jersey had 4 million jobs, 3.6 million jobs in New York City. So from less than half the size of New York to 13 percent greater. Uh, during this long era of broad suburbanization, 1950 to 2004, New Jersey gained more than 3. Two, more than 2.3 million jobs compared to just 82,000, 2.3 million to 82,000. Uh, and that employment growth pattern defined the locus of 20th century housing demand and transportation needs. Uh, but a new economic normal has emerged in the 2004 uh, to 2015 period. Uh, new Jersey's employment base flatlined while New York City's has exploded. Uh, as shown in the bottom half of the slide in black letters and numbers, uh, New York added 674,000 jobs during this period, while New Jersey gained just 23,000, 674,000 to 23,000. So 20th, 21st century economic growth has been overwhelmingly concentrated at the core of the broad metropolitan <coughs> region, and that's yielded a new economic normal and a new locus of housing demand. Uh, by 2015, the bottom half of the slide, New York City's employment base, 4.2 million jobs, once again exceeded New Jersey's 4 million. Moreover, the strongest job market in New Jersey is a consequence of economic spillover across the Hudson River from the Manhattan Dynamo. Now, I really should have pointed out to you earlier uh, that forecasters are not held in very high esteem uh, in New Jersey. Uh, a story about Albert Einstein, that famous New Jersey resident, will prove instructive here. Now, while Albert is entering heaven, uh, queuing in line, he meets three people. So what does he do? He immediately asks them about their IQ. Uh, the first says 190. Wonderful, says Einstein. We can discuss my theory of relativity. Second answer is 150. Good, says Einstein. I look forward to discussing the prospects for world peace. Third person mumbles 50. Einstein pauses. So what's your economic forecast for next year? <laughs> <laughs> Number three, the once dominant automobile skeletal framework of development. Uh, development in the second half of the 20th century uh, was predicated and built uh, on this highway, freeway, and toll road skeletal framework. Uh, it was the foundational base of New Jersey's great 20th century suburban job creation machine. Uh, and it underpinned the great uh, suburban office building boom of the 1980s, which completely reinvented the New Jersey Jersey economic landscape. By 1990, 80 percent of all the office space ever built in the history of New Jersey had gone up in the decade of the 80s, 80 percent. Uh, as you all know, the goldfinch is New Jersey's official state bird. Uh, in the 1980s, it was supplanted by the crane, the construction <laughs> crane. Uh, in 1980, New Jersey was a non-player in the regional office market centered on Manhattan. By 1990, the 11 county northern and central New Jersey market area had emerged as the nation's fifth largest metropolitan office market. Uh, at the same time, Manhattan's share of the regional office market slipped from 85 percent to 55 percent, 85 to 55. The end result was one of the greatest suburban office agglomerations in the United States. Uh, much of it located in freeway and highway-oriented uh, growth corridors. That was the nation's cutting-edge growth model at the time, uh, and it was New Jersey's core competency, and it drove housing demand ever outward. Uh, but it is increasingly an obsolete spatial competency, uh, which leads to, which the discussion started earlier, the incredible shrinking outer suburban office footprint. Uh, right now, New Jersey's uh, office ecosystems are being reconfigured with a vengeance. Uh, the economic reality of today and tomorrow increasingly suggests uh, that there is simply too much old, obsolete suburban inventory. Uh, 
The outer suburban office footprint is going to contract. It has been contracted. It is oversupplied and under demolished, oversupplied and under demolished. And we are already seeing stranded assets on our economic landscape. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, this is the former palatial global headquarters of Merck in White House Station uh, in Hunterdon County. Uh, it was one, undeniably one of the greatest suburban office buildings ever constructed uh, on this planet. It's clad in Spanish granite, a 1900 car underground parking garage. Built in 1992, 2016 vacant. The former U.S. headquarters of BASF in Mount Olive, Western Morris County, built in 1993, vacant in 2016. So what is their future? Can they be repurposed? Well, we just have, happen to have an excellent example of a fundamental repurposing of a large campus in the Nutmeg State. Uh, this was once the crown jewel of Aetna, located in Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, it was built in eight, 1983. At the time, it, at 1.3 million square feet, it was the largest building ever constructed in Connecticut. Uh, fast forward uh, to 2011 and an era of advanced information technology changing the way work takes place. And this is how this parcel uh, was uh, repurposed to fit the needs of the new economy. Going, going, almost gone. Just the elevator towers remain to be demolished. It was far cheaper uh, to knock down the building than to keep paying utility bills and property taxes. So it has been repurposed to 260 acres of open space. Uh, so is deconstruction a new suburban uh, office normal? Uh, in many cases yet, Nonetheless, we will be seeing a new form of suburban economic organization centered around sur suburban activity uh, zones. So I think the reports of widespread suburban demise may be premature. Uh, our future suburban office ecosystem is just being invented. And has been mentioned earlier, it will comprise mixed-use developments centered near existing suburban centers and activity concentrations and it will involve repurposing obsolete campuses with new or repurposed structures, incorporating new economy work environment imperatives as well as mixed uses. Uh, two, example, two examples, number one, uh, which Mike just mentioned, Bridgewater, uh, Somerville. This is the former Sanofi Research Campus in Bridgewater, Somerset County, close to downtown Somerville. Uh, now, Sanofi still kept its U.S. headquarters in suburban Bridgewater, but it has shifted all its R&D to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and this was how the vacant research campus looked after Sanofi departed. Uh, the highway at the bottom is Interstate 287. It is now being successfully redeveloped by Advanced Realty as a 24-7 LWP environment. Uh, the high-tech complex is now called Center of Excellence. Uh, it already has several major tenants, including Ashland and has been, as was mentioned earlier, Nestle Health Sciences. Uh, and in green there is a mixed-use village area, which will have a hotel, residential, retail, uh, and the like, and that's received municipal approval. So it will soon be a fully repurposed office campus. Uh, a second example, uh, the former Bell Labs in Whippany, uh, close to downtown Morristown. This was a totally obsolete Cold War f research facility. Uh, that a uh, complex structure there in the foreground had three foot thick uh, uh, concrete walls uh, in order to block anybody from figuring out what's going on inside those buildings. Uh, this is the redevelopment uh, plan by Vision Real Estate Partners, uh, and it's actually repurposing two of the office buildings of the Bell Labs complex. Uh, the arrows point at the project's major components, uh, headquarters building for Bayer, and MetLife Investments, uh, and then a mixed-use component like the Center for Excellence that's shown on the bottom of the slide. Uh, the finished Bayer building is exactly like this rendering, as is the recently occupied global headquarters of MetLife uh, Investments. Both companies, Bayer and MetLife Investments, move from other facilities in the Morris County market area, and I think that's a new corporate protocol 
a game of suburban musical chairs to achieve new work environments and reduce their overall real estate footprint. Uh, now that protocol is not unique to New Jersey. Uh, for example, uh, the massive Hudson Yards project in Manhattan uh, is a case example. And many of the tenants to date that have signed on uh, will be relocating from other locations in Manhattan. They're often, often consolidating from multiple locations and often consuming less office space. And they are also vacating obsolete space in the city in order to secure uh, the new 21st century work environments. Okay, back to the Garden State. Uh, these two transformer, transformational examples now represent next generation suburban economic assets. Uh, there are other examples, Bell Labs or Bell Works in Holmdel, uh, which was mentioned earlier, as well as the Exxon former ExxonMobil Research Park in Florham Park. Uh, suffice it to say, while well, obsolete suburban product will continue to be removed from the uh, office inventory, we do have a suburban office ecosystem that is transforming, reinventing, and redefining itself into next generation assets. Uh, the new rail-centric skeletal framework of development uh, for net new growth uh, in the future, and I say net new growth, the Garden State's rail network has emerged as the economic and demographic determinant, and it is determining the new geography of housing demand and workplace preferences in the 21st century. Uh, and this will be the new developmental normal in the decades ahead. Again, has, that has been mentioned earlier, a flatlining demographic uh, perimeter, 20th century, population moving ever outward from a sagging regional core. Uh, 21st century, population shrinkage at the metropolitan edge and a resurgent uh, regional core. This, this slide shows uh, population change for the 2010 to 2015 period for the 35 counties in the broad uh, four state region uh, centered on New York City. Uh, the population losing counties are in red uh, they are not suffering massive population losses, uh, but they are declining. All of the other counties had population growth. So a new spatial demography is emerging, population stagnation at the metropolitan edge, and it afflicts all four counties, not just New Jersey. Uh, so the metropolitan perimeter is not what it used to be. Uh, information technology and artificial intelligence, uh, obviously, uh, Advances in IT, particularly mobile IT, have fundamentally disrupted many 20th century work, nor work norms. And that's already yielded contractions in middle-skilled white-collar jobs. Uh, it has changed the very nature of knowledge-based work, the shape of the economy, uh, and it's even accelerating in the 21st century. Uh, outlook, further disruptions to all established protocols and sustained uh, advances in information technology, uh, as well as sustained advances by its more potentially disruptive partner, artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence, or AI, is just in its emerging stages. Today, it resembles the internet of the mid-1990s. Uh, if that's the prototype, it will soon be built into everything, uh, AI everywhere, just as the internet is everywhere today. Uh, when we think of AI and robots, we often think of this guy. Uh, is this our knowledge-based economy disruptor future? Uh, does automobile manufacturing uh, uh, provide a precedent? This is the way we once produced automobiles. Uh, we had high-paying, blue-collar jobs. Uh, this was the Ford plant in Mawa. When it opened in 1950, it was the largest automobile production facility uh, in the world, and it closed three decades later in 1980. Uh, this is the way they are produced today. Uh, not really human worker free, but a far less human presence. Uh, land use uh, implications. Uh, the once glorious Packard motor car factory of yesteryear. This has absolutely nothing to do with New Jersey, but when I was a kid, Packard was one of my favorite cars. And Peter, didn't you own a Packard when you were a young man? 
Might have a horse. Of tea. <laughs> <laughs> the remaining carcass uh, as it looks today. Uh, will AI have the same impact on, on white collar work in offices as robots did on blue collar work in factories? Uh, is it going to produce more etnas? Well, here's a possible scenario going forward. Uh, early stage young robot. Mature stage adult robot. <laughs> robot helper. Robot player. Robot assistant. Robot challenger. Robot dominance. Uh, so this represents a growing fear uh, to our knowledge-based economy. Uh, what does this mean for the office of the future? Well, this is the office of the distant past with primitive electronic calculators. In this instance, pencil and paper ledger ruled. Uh, the office of the present, information technology rules. Uh, is this the office of the future? Artificial intelligence rules. Uh, so while tech, all these technological advances continue, uh, much of the physical region is aging uh, rapidly, which leads to observation uh, number eight, a post-mature suburban housing stock. Uh, this is one dimension of broad-based aging. Uh, the 1950 to 1970 period was New Jersey's golden housing production era. Like the creature from the Black Lagoon, fact how suburbia oozed across the New Jersey landscape. Now, during this era, young families moved into Levittown-style dwellings. These were 800 square foot tributes to modesty at the rate of 1,000 per week, 1,000 per week for 1,000 straight weeks. That yielded 1 million housing units uh, in the 20 years between 1950 and 1970. So fast forward to 2045. Uh, the inventory produced during this early period will be between 75 and 95 years of age. So vast swaths of tract house suburbia built in the post-war era will be at the end of their life cycle, uh, if they are still standing. Uh, what is to be done? I don't know, but it's going to be a major problem. Uh, other aging economic and infrastructure assets? Uh, 2045, we are going to have a vast inventory of other aging physical product. Uh, a relatively young one, Verizon's operation, uh, operations headquarter, global operations headquarter in Basking Ridge, uh, formerly the AT&T headquarters, will be 68 years of age in 2045. Will it still be viable economically? But we are not alone. Let's cross the river to New York City. Uh, the Empire State Building. In 2045, it will be 114 years old, 114 years old. Uh, Amtrak's Hudson River Tunnels opened in 1910. They will be 135 years old in 2045. So suffice it to say, we have a vast problem of aging assets to surmount over the next three decades. Finally, I can do this quickly, uh, further transformational innovations. Uh, we can be certain there will be innovations that we can't anticipate <coughs> today that are going to be future game changers, uh, technological innovations that will cascade across the region. For example, this has been mentioned before, uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, they have the potential to fundamentally alter all of the spatial dynamics we're talking about. And as has been discussed, there are a number of possible impacts uh, that they will have. Uh, we can't, we don't know exactly what it's going to be, but we know uh, they're going to be there. Uh, so too, the impact of drones, uh, that's going to change, uh, have a major force in land use. So both of these technologies were not on our radar screen just a short time ago. So the world we think may be coming may not be the world that actually arrives because of the potential innovations and disruptions by things not yet invented. Now, for those words you have been longing to hear, perhaps desperately longing to hear, in conclusion, uh, actually that sigh of relief I heard is just premature. My conclusions tend to be very long. But time is of the essence. I think I'm over already. Uh, these are some of the driving forces uh, today that are pushing us toward 2045. Uh, so fasten your seat belts, it's going to be a wild ride. Now, an old presentation proverb says, 
any old place in a presentation is a good place to stop. So if at this point I've given a good presentation, this is a good place to stop. But if at this point I've given a bad presentation, this is a hell of a good place to stop. <laughs> in any case, I'm stopping here. Thank you very much.